Welcome to another edition of Wildcat Country, powered by Backcourt Marketing. Eric Cohen and Shane Dale, and it's a half victorious episode and a half a little disappointing episode. We're recording this on Monday night, right after the uh, women's team uh, fell to North Carolina. Didn't have a great shooting performance. So they fell short. But Shane, the men's team, took care of business last night uh, against uh, a TCU. I almost called him Houston. So we'll break that down. AJ Bramlett, national champion up on the 97 team, going to join us. So we'll talk more with him. But Shane, before we get going, the first question I have to ask you, and there's plenty to talk about in buy or sell, but this is a not, not a buy or sell question. Let's talk about the last play in regulation after Ben Mather and his set three. Oh, let's. Was it a foul? Was it a backcourt violation? Or was it a good no call? All right. I, I want to nutshell this because I'm I'm and I'm fine talking about it. It's a legit question, but I, I yeah. I'm I'm kind of done with it after this. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, first of all, it was a backcourt violation. Okay. Look, th- there was there was a subjective part of this of that situation, and there was a completely non-subjective part. Subjective is whether there was a foul. Okay. Mm-hmm. A little bit of contact happens late in games. Officials don't call it. They're not going to call something that that far away from the hoop. Typically, anyway, they don't want to be the ones deciding these games. Okay. Agree. Yeah. The backcourt violation, which occurred largely before the contact with yeah. uh, with, with was it with Dale and Terry, largely before the contact. The, uh, the ball uh, hit the half court line uh, guy's foot went over the line, despite what Seth Davis says, that's a backcourt right. violation. Yeah. I mean, Notorious U of a hater. Seth never, Davis. never go yeah. full Rex Chapman, Seth. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it should have been backcourt. And then if they're not going to call backcourt, then I guess there should have been a foul. But then when the guy falls to the ground and which was a flop, I mean, I'm sure there was contact. Okay. And maybe in a regular situation, that's a foul. But number one, it was already backcourt. And then at that point, he just falls to the ground because that's all he could do because he was he was about to lose the ball. So I'm tired of it. And, you know, there are a dozen examples, not a dozen, but at least a half dozen legit examples of Arizona not getting calls, including uh, when Ben, ben Matherin took a shot to the face on that, that ridiculous dunk he had in the second yep. half of the type yep. of game. So yep. this is the last I want to talk about it. I mean, if you have a follow-up, that's fine. But after this podcast, I'm done with it. I'm moving on. Arizona one, suck it up and deal with it. So I've gotten enough dumb texts from ASU and, and a TCU friend today about this. And then obviously the tweet storm we had, uh, you were interacting with the director, former director of officials in the NCAA yeah. earlier, yeah, uh, who said it was a foul, whatnot. First of all, my take on it is uh, the guy, you, you know, you shouldn't bail somebody out. Uh, who's what 40 feet from the basket making right. a stupid decision. So that's number one. Number two, I think TCU fans really would have had a gripe had Dale and Terry's last second shot been before the buzzer and Arizona had one like that. Then we could have, then you could have, you know, bitched all you wanted to TCU fans. But the fact of the matter is you had five minutes after that to win the game. And it was, it was level at that point. It was a tie game. Yeah. So I don't want to hear it that, Oh, we got robbed. If you have to win at the free throw line when your guy is, you know, straddling the half court line and the out of bounds line, you know, with with 10 seconds left, you don't deserve it. I'm sorry, but you don't deserve a call there. And they were smart to to not blow the whistle. Well, and beyond that, Eric, if you go back and watch the play, the clock stopped for about a half a second. Right. So then it and was I really think that screwed because, up. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and because the, the timekeeper assumed that the clock was going to I mean, you're not supposed to assume. But you saw an over, you saw an over and back. Right. Assumed that the clock was going to have to stop. Right. And then, so then, if, in that case, if, if Terry had scored and it had oh. counted, that would have been a bigger mess for the officials. So you know, the officials don't want to be the story, and I think they were very fortunate not to be a bigger part of it. But you have, but like other people pointed out, it's a foul or it's backcourt violation. And again, one of them is subjective; the other is not. And so, if anything should have been called, it was backcourt. But I, I, I'm glad that the game had a chance to be decided in overtime because I think yeah. the game deserved, deserved overtime. It was back and forth. Both teams played their guts out. TCU played a heck of a game. Arizona yeah, was did. sloppy to say the, uh, on, in certain areas. Need some other guys to step up. But TC, I mean, TCU beat Kansas earlier this season. They almost beat them twice in a row, and there's a reason for that. They, they gave Arizona a heck of a game. I thought TCU outplayed Arizona, but – we will get more into that in what I'm looking forward to. I think this is going to be my favorite uh, buy or sell presented by Ice Shaker. Uh, I want to thank our friends at Ice Shaker for sponsoring the segment. Shane and I both have our Wildcat Country Ice Shakers. You can check them out, icesshaker.com, and get $5 off using code Wildcat Country, capital W in Wildcat, capital C in country. 
And I'll tell you what, you really want to get one of these cool things. If you can't see this on the video, it is red, white, and blue. It is really good. I put water and ice in here three and a half hours ago just to test it. And the ice is still floating around. Let do, me just do, say that. do the ice shake again. We could hear that on the. Yeah, you can can hear that. There you go. There you go. If you're uh, listening, uh, it, that, that means it works. All right, it does work. At three and a half hours, Shane, it, it, the ice has not melted. All right, number one, Arizona is on bonus time in the NCAA tournament. They're on borrowed time. Buy or sell that, Shane? Could you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by borrowed time in this case? They should, have lost sure. they, they should have lost last. Time. Oh, well, no, I'll sell that. No, no. I mean, oh, come on. Look, well, look, look, let's let's start with the obvious. OK, Arizona has not played well in this tournament no, so far, they have not. at least not to their standards. No, but th- they're still in it because they're just that much better than the teams they've played. They they didn't shoot well from three. They, they uh, against against TCU. They turned it over, I think, 16 times. They gave up 20 offensive rebounds, which a team the size of Arizona has no business doing. Right. But they won because they're the better team. And, and you, you go to overtime, you need to get lucky a little bit here and there. But they're better than TCU. So, no, I, I don't think they're on borrowed time. I, I think that they had some clutch shots. Dalen Terry hit a big three. Ben Matherin hit a huge three down the stretch uh, or with about 12 seconds left or whatever it was. And, uh, you know, with either without either of those baskets, Arizona probably goes home. But they got the players who could make those shots and they did. And they the, the game was poorly officiated. I think it was poorly officiated evenly. If you're a TCU fan, or you just rooting for the underdog, of course, you're going to see it like, you know, TCU got robbed this or that. You got a lot of people in the media who act that way. And I think it's irresponsible, but that's neither here nor there, but I'm going to sell that. I think they're on borrowed time. I, I think that they, they earned their way here to this point, despite not playing their best. And with that said, they're going to have to play better going forward. Yes. Now they were up nine with what, six minutes left last night, then give up what a 10 run, 10 0, 12, 12, runs, maybe 12 in a row. Yeah. 12 0 run. Yeah. I mean, just this team should have been out. Let's be honest. This team should, have, in my opinion, should have been out. So I'm buying that. Uh, let's go to, to 1A. This is a, I, I'm going to be throwing bonus questions at you uh, as we go along. Well, you're, you're, you're fired up. This is I'm, fun. I'm fired up. Okay. 1A, Ben Matherin shot. Uh, to tie the game in regulation was the biggest Arizona basketball shot that you can remember since 2005, Salim Stoudemire to beat Oklahoma state in the sweet 16 by yourself. Oh oh boy. A single shot, Um, single shot. You know what I'll put up there. I'll put up Derek Williams and one against Texas in the second round back in 2011. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, they forced the yeah. five second violation, which is another yeah. controversial call. And we had to hear That's about right. that forever yeah. too. And then uh, Derek Williams gets the, gets the, uh, the ball and a great bounce pass from, from, from the King of bounce passes in the back in the day, Kyle Fogg hits the end one gets the free throw and Arizona holds on and wins by a point. So in terms of single baskets, yeah. I'd probably put that one up there. And then of course, you know, Jamel Horn knocks down that three in 2011. That would have been up there too. But uh, well, that would have been number one. That I mean, would have been number been, one. That would have gotten that to the final four. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Probably. But I. But so I will say it's the biggest shot in the tournament for Arizona since that play by Derek Williams because without it, Arizona doesn't go to the Sweet 16 and they don't beat top seeded Duke. True, but with a team with this kind of expectations. The game on the line, the guy, it was a 26 footer mm-hmm. from the logo, you know, and you could see court. it coming. You could see him calling for the screen. I mean, it was, it was such a garbage possession and Ben saved them. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we could talk about the dunk, which was probably the best dunk I think I've ever seen uh, from an Arizona player. It was Vince Carter esque is what I said to my friends at the time when I was watching I mean, It was unbelievable. I, I literally stood up. I think we all did stood up. We're like, Oh my God. But that shot that Ben Matherin had to tie the game was something else. So I want to savor that. And I I just don't want to underestimate the importance of that. Uh, Number two in buy or sell. uh, Do you buy the fact that Tommy Lloyd's substitution patterns against TCU were baffling? Buy or sell? I don't want to keep asking to be more specific, but could you give me a couple examples of what you're talking about here? Azulis Tabellis, I know he was not off to a good start, but he played 16 minutes. This is arguably the second or third best player on Arizona's team. Arizona's struggling and you're not giving this guy another chance. It's very strange to me. I would say it's baffling. And Tommy Lloyd said after the game that Tabellus probably wasn't happy with him. And I'm sure he wasn't, but uh, hopefully that lights a fire under him and they're going to need him to play better going forward for sure. But I would say it would be more baffling if Tommy Lloyd hadn't done that before. We mm-hmm. saw him uh, sit both both Tubelis and Ben Matherin, which is yep. unfathomable as we're speaking right now, 
in the final minutes against UCLA at home. And that turned out to work just fine. He, he went big with, with Coloco and, and Ballo out there. Uh, or is it Ballo or Ballo? I've heard Ballo. Ballo. Okay. I've been Ballo. pronouncing it wrong this whole time. I apologize. Omar Ballo. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, baffling. I don't know. I mean, it, I think Ty Miller has a good sense and his assistants probably, you know, get in his ear and say, look, this guy just is off. It's not working. You know, I think he, he's got to, you, you can't Shane, you can't keep him out the whole, they were getting crushed on the boards. Yeah. Put this guy in there. And, and I, I grant you that we'd be talking about that more. You know, we're talking about the most right now they had lost is Kirk Reese's shot selections. Um, but the fact that he was out there late in the game, I'm not sure that was necessarily the best idea. All right, uh, so I, I, I had probably objected that more than to Bellis being benched. Okay, so so you are not you are selling the fact that his substitution passion, patterns were baffling. I'm not baffling. I mean, they're questionable. Yes, baffling. No, because I understand why he did it. Uh, number three, uh, the Wildcats would have been better last night had Kirk Creesa not played by or sell. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to buy oh. it. I, 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 well, and I think, and I say that as someone who thinks that they're going to need him going forward. They're going to need him to play better than he did against TCU. He did take a, a, a charge when he first came in the game. Yep. Uh, and that was big and he's great at doing those kinds of things and just frustrating opponents. And, and maybe some of the intangibles on the court of him just, you know, getting under his opponent's skin was a big deal. I don't really know. We couldn't hear what was going on, uh, but he didn't play well. He didn't play well. And, and this was, you know, Arizona looked sharper at times uh, when he wasn't on the court again. I mean, I don't know about Wright state, but you know, Colorado and, and UCLA that they, they, they look just fine, especially in the final minutes against UCLA without him. I think they're a better team overall with Kirk Cree, So don't get me wrong. And I'm not saying don't play him the rest of the tournament. If he's, if he's good to go, then I, and I hope he is, then you got to play him. But in this particular game uh, against, against TCU, Arizona wasn't, he wasn't good. Uh, there's no, there's no two ways around it. He wasn't good. I will sell that Shane. I think uh, Kirk Creaser brings a fire to this Arizona team that I didn't see from Justin Kyer. Kyer is one of the guys last night that looks scared to me. Just a little bit like, oh my God, this could be my last college basketball game. Mm -hmm. I, I thought he looked tentative. I thought Balo looked tentative. And I thought to Bellis, so those guys stood out. Kerr was fearless as we saw with his late game chucking fest of three oh, pointers gosh. in the corner, which all of us were yelling simultaneously, no, stop, don't do this. But of course, there's several times over the season where we've said the same thing and then he makes a ridiculous he shot. Hit one. So, he hit yeah. one, but one of 10. Yeah. Arizona is better when Kirk Crease, he looked healthy to me. So I'm not blaming the ankle there. Mm -hmm. The Wildcats are better with Kirk Creesa. They need they needed that fire, especially last night. If Kerr doesn't play, regardless of the one for 10, Arizona's not winning that game. I'm just telling you that. In my, my opinion. I mean, okay. call That's me crazy fair. on that take. It's it's some people may disagree with that. All right. Number four. So last night we saw Christian Coloco was phenomenal. And, and you can talk about why he wasn't getting the ball every single time in the post. I think he started like 10 for 10. It was unbelievable. Uh, Shane, should Wildcat fans be concerned that he's played well enough to this to enter the NBA draft this year? Buy or sell that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll buy it. I mean, I don't think any of us are thinking about that right now. But yeah, I think he's, he's he might have played his way into the first round. I don't know about a lottery pick. Um, he's but, not a lottery. No, no, Matt no, is a lottery pick. No, no, Matt but, Matt but 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 possibly a first round pick. Yeah, if you're concerned about next season, and I'm not there yet, I would be if they had lost uh, to to TCU. Uh, but yeah, I, I think you could buy that, you know, if, if he's projected as a, like a consensus first round pick then, and, and his tournament performance, you know, here's hoping that if his tournament performance convinces him to go pro, hopefully we at least get a final four out of it before he goes. So yeah, if you're, if that's something that you're concerned about right now as a Wildcat fan, then yeah, I'll go ahead and buy it. Okay. For a, uh, throwing in another bonus question as we go along here, uh, Tommy Lloyd's game plan was poor after the beginning in that they didn't keep going down to Christian Coloco after he was dominating in the first half. Buy or sell that? I'll sell it just because Ben Matherin looked fantastic in the second half. And, and, and I think that, yes, they should have gone to him a little bit more, uh, to Coloco a little bit more. But I, I, I don't necessarily blame that, that decision uh, on um, – you know, on, on what, on what they, where they possibly could have lost the game. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, a lot more before we're done 
uh, in this podcast episode about that the game against Houston because I think that I have some wait, 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 wait. I have some keys to that. No, no, yeah. I know I have some keys to that game, and I think Christian Coloco is obviously going to be a big part of that. Yeah. So, no, I, I don't know. I mean, Christian Coloco dominated the first half, and Matherin dominated the uh, the second half and an overtime. But yeah, there were definitely times where they should have just they should have fed him the ball more. And I, I, I you know, going forward, and we'll t- I know we'll talk about this more later, but I, I would like to see Coloco and Balo on the court together a little bit more. But I, I, you know what, Balo to me last night um, was not great. I no, was he wasn't. Just, I, I was not impressed. I mean, that's where I would have put two Bellos back in the game, and that's where I, I disagreed with the way Tommy Lloyd managed that game. But you know what, they got the win, so uh, all's we'll well that ends well. Right? All's well that ends well. Okay, number five. Uh, Arizona has the toughest region draw remaining of any number one seed. Oh, buy or sell? Buy it. It's not. It's not close. It's not close. Uh, three of the top five remaining teams in net rankings are in the South. Three of the top eight in Ken Palm are in the South. It's not close. They're, they're, it is such a loaded bracket. And that doesn't even include Michigan, which is finally playing like we thought Michigan right. would play earlier. It was number in the four season. when Arizona beat them in, the That's con- right. in, in November. Remember That's that. right. That's yeah. right. So, yeah, no contest. This is the toughest region left of Arizona. And, and I, I tweeted this earlier as well. I think this might be the toughest road to the final four that Arizona oh, yeah. ha- has ever had. You know, you, you look back to, and we'll talk to AJ Bramlett about this back in 97, they had to play number one, Kansas, like the number one team in the country loaded Kansas team. Yeah. The other three teams they played were double digit seeds. Yeah. So you have to keep that in mind. So, you know, if it, if it's Houston and then you know, likely Villanova, maybe Michigan, but likely Villanova, those two teams are very similar in terms of tempo, very slow, methodical tempo, in terms of being loaded with, with experienced guys, with guys who have been in the final four and in Villanova's case, won a national championship. So Arizona is going to have to run the gauntlet just to get to the final four. The South is stacked. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you look at like Kansas, I mean, they got the dream draw. Like why couldn't have Arizona have ended up in that bracket? It's Kansas against Providence. So I really don't think is that good. And then they get the winner of Iowa state and Miami and it's two double digit seeds. And you're like, what? I mean, Bill Self is going to luck himself into a final four. Mean, meanwhile, you know, Tommy Lloyd's got to go through this gauntlet of facing yeah. Houston, who was a top five team at one point. And, and then either uh, if they win, Michigan, who was top five at one point, and then Villanova, who I think was uh, as high as number one or number two at, at one point, something like that. You know, I watched Villanova. I remember watching Villanova and UCLA early in the year, and I was like, these are two final four teams. I hope I'm wrong about one of them. Because I still think UCLA in that in that bracket, I don't buy Purdue. Uh, yeah. I don't, you know, I don't. North Carolina had a nice win over Baylor, but I don't buy them. I mean, UCLA's got. A, I think UCLA has a much easier road than Arizona does. And Gonzaga, okay, Gonzaga gets Arkansas, who barely could muster fifty the other day against New Mexico State, and then they have to go play, you know, Duke or, or Texas Tech. But it'll be a challenge. It'll be a challenge. I mean, I, that, more I, more so than what Kansas is facing for sure. Yes. But I think Villanova is better than both Duke and Texas Tech. So Agreed. I, think, I think right now, if Arizona makes the final four, they have earned it. I also think this is kind of a weird take. And we'll talk more about this in the last segment, though, Shane. Like, if Arizona doesn't make the final four, I won't be as upset as I probably would have been going into the tournament. Just because looking at this road is it's so hard to, yeah. to win this bracket, you know? Yeah, and it's so hard. Well, I think generally it's, it's just it's so hard to win four games in a row in this tournament period. You know, Arizona's had some yeah. very good teams over the years that hadn't won, yeah. won four in a row. You know, th- the last five times they've been to the, the Elite Eight, they've lost that game. Yeah. Uh, so it, a lot of it sometimes it takes a little bit of luck. It takes a, a good draw. But yeah, Arizona will have earned every inch of, of, of a uh, of a final four if, if they happen to be there in a few days. All right, but bonus question number one or number three, however you want to look at it. Um, so this is, has nothing to do with Arizona, but I just want to talk about the NCAA tournament. I, I don't like to see teams that are the St. Peter's of the world win games. When it comes to the Sweet 16, I want to see the best teams play. Do you buy or sell liking the upsets or do you want to see a favorites win like I do? So we see the best teams play in the, when it comes down to it. I think you could certainly argue that are they really the best teams that they're going to lose to, to a team like St. Peter's? I know it's look, I know it's a single elimination tournament and it was best two out of three Kentucky would have won, but you know, Kentucky shouldn't need a second chance to beat a team like St. Peter's. Yes, so, agreed. So I, and I think, you know, a lot, 
just looking in my bracket, all my final four teams are still in it. Who knows Same. for how much, yeah, who knows for how much longer, yeah. but you know, I didn't pick Kentucky to, I picked Kentucky to lose to UCLA in the elite eight. So I picked them to get further than they did. Same here. I didn't, I didn't think Baylor was going to get that far. I didn't think Auburn was going to get that far. I thought Tennessee might get farther. And I thought uh, Wisconsin would get to the elite eight too. That's the other yeah. one I missed. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I'm not, I, I'm surprised by some individual results. Like I didn't see St. Peter's coming, but all of the top teams that have been eliminated to this point haven't shocked me. I, I thought that they would be eliminated maybe a little bit later in some cases, like, you know, the lead eight or the sweet 16, but I'm not stunned by any of the eliminations so far, because I thought a lot of those teams were not really title contenders to begin with. All well, right. But, but you see Iowa who wins the big 10 championship, you mm-hmm. know, they're out in the first round. I mean, Kentucky was, was a stunner, but like, I don't want to see St. Peter's and that's why I'm going to harp on this again. The men's bracket needs to do what the women do, which is the top four seeds host on their home floor in the first two rounds. I know it didn't work out for Arizona. They got one win against UCLA and then got smoked against North Carolina. But I think it's still like the best teams in women's basketball generally are advancing to the Sweet 16. I don't think Arizona is one of the 16 best teams going into the tournament. I said I told that to you in the weeks beforehand. You're talking about the women's side. The women's side, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's why on the men's side, I would like to see – you know, the um, I'd like to see the, the you know, top 16 seeds host uh, a 14 regional. I think that 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 would give me more of the favorites that I would like to see in this round. You know, I'm excited to watch Duke and Texas Tech. I have no interest whatsoever in watching St. Peter's and Purdue. None. A, a 15 seed against the three. That doesn't I mean, I'm sorry, but it, it doesn't do it for me. So, OK, that's that's I just want to throw out that point. I know some people are going to tell me I'm an idiot for that one. No, you're not an idiot. I, 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 but I, 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 respect, I, I yeah. respectfully disagree with you. On okay. That. Fair. Okay. Uh, the next bonus question. So there was a big coaching announcement in college basketball that was relevant to Arizona fans. Uh, Sean Miller going back to Xavier. Shane, would you buy that you would like to see Sean Miller and Arizona schedule a home and home series so he can get his due from the McHale Center crowd in the next couple of years. Buy or sell that? I'd like to see. Sure, I think it'd be fun to see. I, I don't think it's going to happen. But I, I, I'd. Uh, by the way, did you like my my Photoshop of Sean Miller in the, yes. the Savior yes, shirt? I spent a lot of time on that. Made him look younger and thinner and everything. Your Google uh, search was great. Yeah, I, I, I love. But uh, yeah, I no, I'd love to see it. I think that would be fun. I, I don't know if that's necessarily something Sean Miller would want to do. I don't think he was thrilled about having to play Xavier in the tournament twice, especially after they beat him the second time because the, the selection committee loves to do those things. But, you know, along those lines, I don't know if they necessarily would have to do a home and home. I, I agree. I'd love to, you know, Sean Miller to get a nice ovation from the fans yeah. and then hopefully, you know, beat him. Uh, but there's a good chance at some point that Arizona is going to, going to have to face Xavier in the tournament again, because the committee loves doing that kind of thing. So even if we don't get the home and home, we'll probably get Tommy Lloyd versus Sean Miller at some point. If you, if you were at the game, let's say they play at McHale center and you were at the game where Xavier came back there. Would you, would you cheer for Sean Miller? Like, exuberantly oh, yeah. or would you be like okay cool nice you know good to see oh you. like eh, i don't know how exuberant i get anyway but yeah no i, I give him a nice round of applause i give him a standing you know he, he put up with okay. a lot and um and and some some fairly some unfairly during right. the last few years and and it was a tough road and you know i i don't know a coach that's gotten closer to the final four several times without getting there than he has. And I think that's an, sort of an unfair knock on him. So, you know, I I'm thrilled with the current situation. Obviously Tommy Lloyd looks like a home run higher at this yep. point, regardless of what mm-hmm. happens the rest of this tournament. Uh, but I, I would give Sean Miller a, a, a an nice ovation. I wouldn't, you know, I don't know how many guys like or, or players or coaches I, I necessarily go crazy for at my age. So. It, and in the longest buy or sell segment that we've ever had presented by a shaker, the last question is, should Arizona immediately schedule a home and home with TCU after what we saw in the, in the round of 32? Oh, that'd be fun. I'd love to see that too. Yeah. That'd, that'd be great games. The fans would be fired up for it in Tucson and, and, and Fort oh, Worth. And what, and, and Fort Worth it'd be a mess. Yeah. I mean, those fans would be, and you know what? Kirk Creasa would be eating that up. I would love to mm-hmm. see that. So, and, and I'll just mention real quick, just kind of a preview for our last segment. Um, you know, Arizona might be at a bit of a home court disadvantage against Houston. I think that the, the Wildcats thrive on that. I think they're, they they love being the villains, and I think that that might actually fuel them more. I'm not saying they're going to win or lose. We'll save that for later. But having a majority of possibly a majority of Houston fans cheering against them uh, could could feel something in them that we haven't seen yet. 
Is it wrong that I think that crowd is going to be equal at at worst for Arizona? It might Even be. Though- I really think Arizona's going to travel well to San Antonio. Oh, I agree. I think they'll travel well. I think it'll be, I, I agree. I think it'll be about even, but I think that any other team, they would, they would have a home court advantage. If they, if they were to advance against Villanova or Michigan, it would be, I think it would be kind of like, you remember when Arizona played UConn in the elite eight in uh, Anaheim, that was almost like a home game for yeah. Arizona. It didn't yeah. work out, but it was, it sounded like, like McHale. And I, I feel like if they play Villanova or Michigan, that's what will happen. Now, A.J. Bramlett's coming up next. And, and I lied, Shane. I have one more question for you. Just talk about watching that game last night. Um, what, what, was, what did it feel like to you? I mean, how, did you, how were you feeling during the game, after the game? Did you sleep? Uh, could you fall asleep hours? Out? Like, what? Explain how you reacted to that. I, I um, well, during the game, I mean, I, I don't know about the rest of the fans, but I kind of think certain ways during the game. Okay. Arizona's up at halftime. Oh, they're probably going to win. And then I start you know, letting myself think about the next game, which is always a mistake. Then they're down three with a couple of minutes left. And my first thought is, is this really happening? And my second thought is, well, at least we don't have to worry about the rest of the tournament and being stressed out the rest of the, the way. Um, so I tried to, you know, try to make the best of it. And so, you know, uh, I'm fully emotionally invested in it. Sometimes I wonder why I do this to myself, but yep. uh, I'm glad we were able to talk about a win. And I, and I, you know, wound, wound down before bedtime by watching some, uh, some, uh, a great, a great new reality series on Netflix called, is it cake? It's a great series. You should check it out. It, it basically people make, they make, make, make cakes that look like different things and you have to guess whether it's cake no. or not. It's fantastically no. stupid. My mm-hmm. wife and I, it's one of the things they can enjoy shows we can enjoy together. And it was a great way to wind down. So uh, that's how I spent my, uh, my Sunday evening. And, and, and it might be how I spend my Thursday evening as well. If you hear my, my voice, not quite a hundred percent in this episode, it's because I was getting fired up watching this team uh, last night I was at a sport, a local sports bar. I won't share where that was, but with a couple of buddies and, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was obnoxious because there were other Arizona fans. When are you school. ever obnoxious? I, I, I was, I was more obnoxious than usual. And I will say this Arizona basketball, especially early round games of Arizona basketball, bring out the worst in me. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they get, I, I never feel in any other, like watching the Packers. I'm a Packer fan watching the the Cubs. I'm a Cubs fan. Like, I don't feel that way like I do watching this team in early round games when I'm afraid they're going to choke. You know, the only time I was ever afraid of, of you, like in person, Eric, was when we were in Las Vegas for the Pac-12 tournament a few years ago, and you had a bunch of different bets. You were watching you know, yeah. the, all the big screens and then uh, on yeah. at the, I think it was at the Orleans Arena or whatever. Where, where no, no, we it? were at the Mandalay Bay. Mandalay, Mandalay Bay, Mandalay yeah. Bay. Yeah. And you get into it, man. You get focused and it's like, you just turn into a different person. That It was a little frightening. So, you know, you as a fan, I can handle the, the, the no. gambling, Eric, when you've got like eight different bets going at the same time, you know, you, I'll, I'll, I'll social distance myself. I, Shane, I will tell you, me watching that game last night was worse by far than any uh, gambling I have ever had. I mean, it was the ultimate roller coaster. Couldn't fall asleep for hours. Yeah. It was nauseating. And as you said, Shane, I, I, you know, I just, I can't do this to myself. I have to calm down. And that's why you and I in our third segment will make our predictions. But first, coming up next, it's AJ Bramlett, national champion here on Wildcat Country, powered by Backcourt Marketing. What's up, Wildcat Country? Chris Krakowski here. Bear down. Let's go. I wanted to introduce you to the newest sponsor of the Wildcat Country podcast. That's the ice shaker. So check this out. Keep your drinks hot. Keep your drinks cold. We got you covered. Snag one today. Use coupon code Wildcat Country at iceshaker.com. Shane, it's great to have a national champion on the show yet again. I know it was for his second appearance. He was awesome the first time. We're very glad to have AJ Brownlett back. He was a uh, starter on the 1997 national championship team, Wildcats uh, uh, basketball. And well, we hope the 2022 version can get there. As we've talked about, Shane, it's been an interesting road thus far. AJ, last night, you know, what were you doing watching that game and how did you react to it? Were you yelling out loud like Shane and I have were? Oh, yeah, man. I was jumping up and down, uh, you know, going crazy. It was a roller coaster of emotions last night for sure. Uh, but um, I had faith, man. I, I felt like we were going to pull it out uh, even early in the game. I mean, TCU 
played extremely well, man. And, you know, Lampkin was a monster last night. And every time, time he seemed like we were going to pull away, he, he made a play or, you know, uh, his emotion and energy was just incredible. So, um, you know, it was, it was an awesome game, man. And, you know, I, I just enjoyed it. Um, you know, seeing Ben and, and CeeLo play the way that they did and, and DT as well. And, um, even, uh, even Kerr out there, you know, toughing it out, um, doing what he could do. Um, it was just, it was fun, man. I really enjoyed it. It was stressful for sure. Um, but it, it was, it was a fun night to be a wildcat for sure. I actually didn't do much yelling. I tend to keep it bottled in a little bit more, especially because I have a, a sleeping toddler and it's probably not good for my health. I probably need to like just go outside and let it out or something, but maybe next game. Well, I, I have another opportunity soon. So, you know, AJ, like we talked about before, you guys uh, dodged, dodged a lot of bullets in that 97 tournament. I'm not saying you didn't earn every win because you absolutely did, but lived dangerously pretty much from, from, from beginning to end. Did those close wins, including two overtime wins of your own in 97, help build the team's confidence as you went deeper into the tournament, especially late in games. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, when you prove to yourself that you can come through in the toughest moments um, and, you know, we had some games like that in 97 where, you know, there are close games and, you know, Mike Bibby had to knock down free throws or, you know, JT did or miles or whatever, but in a, in a tournament is just different. Uh, the pressure is different. Uh, you know, the, the lights are a lot brighter. And, you know, I thought we saw that, you know, with our guys in the first game a little bit, you know, just getting used to the kind of the atmosphere of the tournament. And then last night, I mean, they knew it was going to be a battle from the beginning. Um, and for them to be able to make the plays that they did, you know, really down the stretch, I think, you know, DT making that three in the corner was huge, you know, with a couple minutes left that that doesn't go in. I mean, that, that could be, could have been the end of the game right there because they had momentum. Um, at that point, him changing that. And then, you know, the multiple plays that Ben made all night and CeeLo uh, were just incredible. So when you're able to win those games, especially against – and there's going to be another one. I mean, Houston is going to be the same kind of battle from, you know, the first minute to the end. But those guys have proven and uh, that they can come up in the big moments. And Ben, especially – I mean, I wouldn't want to have any other guy in the country taking my shot. You know what I mean? And then last night when – he had the ball. We were down three. I was like, get it to Ben. And, you know, we'll ride with whatever happens, you know, right now. <laughs> Let's just get it to Ben. And you trust him, man. You know, he's he comes through. He's a big clutch player. And, um, you know, I'm happy we have him on, on our team this year because he's a hell of a player, man. Draft stock rising every game as well, for sure. Uh, that 97 tournament, AJ, you guys, you know, like, like we talked about, beating three number one seeds, still the only team to ever do it. And the other three wins were all against double-digit seeds. At this point in the tournament, going into the Sweet 16, do the seeds really matter at all? Not at all. And, you know, there's a reason why the teams that are still in are in. And, you know, they've, been, they've obviously knocked off higher seeds to get there. Um, you know, you could look at the names and, you know, look at St. Peter's and be like, oh, you know, they're, they're out next game. But you don't, you don't know that, especially nowadays across the landscape of college basketball the gap isn't what it used to be. And, you know, when you used to look at a 16 seed or a 13 or, you know, whatever it is, you'd be like, oh, okay, that's a guaranteed win. Or this team's going to, it's just not that way anymore. There's good players all over college basketball, not just playing at blue bloods. And, you know, those guys, um, you know, have a chip on their shoulder. They're waiting for the opportunity to get to play against the Kentucky or, you know, one of those schools and they have enough talent and, and chemistry to, to make damage, to do damage and beat those teams. So at this point in the tournament, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, teams are battle tested. The ones who have made it to the next weekend, you know, are there for a reason. And, you know, we, we have one of the toughest draws. I mean, I've watched Houston all year long. You know, they're a great team, uh, very highly athletic, play extremely hard on the defensive end, crash the boards, it's, you know, sim kind of similar to TCU. So, um, you know, it's going to be a battle for us, but I trust our guys more than more than anyone, uh, any team in the country. Yeah, and AJ, I mean, when you think back to your run in 97, they, they always say about uh, championship teams, they have to go through some adversity in the tournament. You don't see a team generally cruise. Now, Baylor kind of did last year. Was that was that exception? But Gonzaga, everybody thought they were just going to cruise, and then they got UCLA in the Final Four, and then obviously you saw what happened in the championship game. Maybe this was Arizona's moment of, of, of adversity. Talk about, for you guys, from game one, as Shane said, you guys had to deal with that. So you weren't scared of anything, it seemed like, going forward in that tournament. 
No, we weren't. And, you know, going into the tournament, I mean, you know, the last two games of the Pac-10 that year, we lost to Cal and Stanford by, I think, combined three points in both of those games. So we had already been in games where, you know, we didn't come out with the win, but we were in those situations a lot. And, you know, the, even the first round, like, that's a lot of – that first game is something different, man. It's hard to win. Um, you know, there's just a lot of emotions and energy and stuff going on in that first tournament game that you have to overcome, even if you're a higher seed. And in our run, I mean, we were down – you know, 10 points to South Alabama with five minutes to go. And, you know, we're able to muster, you know, the, the will to come back and get that, that win. Same thing happened the next game against college of Charleston. We were down 10 with, I think four and a half to go or something like that and made plays to come back and win. So when you're able to do that and be really with your back against the wall um, and with your teammates and you're able to pull out, you know, plays and make winning plays that, that get you on to the next game, that builds confidence. And, you know, our guys and what we've been saying all year long, they, they really love each other and care about each other and believe in each other 110%. So they don't get down, you know, they keep playing, they keep playing our style. Hopefully that's going to, you know, in the end of the game lead to a win, even if they're down or whatever, they just keep playing. That's one thing I love about them. You never see them fighting and fighting none of that stuff. Like they're, they're just out there, playing their game and, you know, continuing to battle even when times are tough. And that's the sign of a winning team that has, you know, DNA to really make a long run and, and possibly win the whole thing. But, but let's be honest. Let's be honest. That There were a few guys on that team last night uh, that looked like they were playing scared. I, I mean, did you feel the same way? Um, I didn't think they were scared. Uh, you know, I thought, you know, maybe, uh, Azulis had a tough, you know, start to the game, not, not, not normal for him, you know, finishing and things like that, but I didn't think they were scared. Um, you know, I think, uh, TCU was playing well. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, they were playing great defense. They were, you know, stopping us from getting the ball inside. It seemed like in the second half we shot threes for about, you know, four or five minutes in a row. And that was the only shots we were, we were getting. Um, and, but you got to give them credit. They were playing with extremely high energy. Uh, like we said, Lampkin was just a, a monster in there. You know, we couldn't do anything with him. And, you know, CeeLo, you know, he easily could have, you know, gotten down, you know, with that, with Lampkin playing like that. But he didn't. You know, he just kept fighting. And then, you know, you see him with the biggest play of the game really come, coming in to tip dunk that at the end. And uh, he's still just battling. And really, him playing defense, too, at half court, you know, on that trap. Uh, at the end of the game, you don't see a seven foot one guy be able to do that a lot of times. It's get cut off the sideline and then slide his feet like that, and you know, eventually cause a turnover or whatever people are saying on, on the internet. But you know, I thought he went back for it before that anyway. So, um, but you know, I, you got to give him a lot of credit. But you know, I thought these games are our team is new to the tournament. You know, what I mean, these guys haven't been in a situation before, and last night was a, you know, one of the toughest situations you could be in. They came through and made the plays to get to win. So that's a, uh, that's a confidence builder for the next game. Like you mentioned, AJ, uh, Houston's so tough in a lot of different ways. Uh, their tempo is kind of the opposite of Arizona's very mes- a slow, methodical pace, great defense all the way around that they have a big, uh, almost seven footer uh, in uh, Josh Carlton. who's probably going to give, could give Arizona some problems underneath. Put yourself in Tommy Lloyd's shoes, how do you go about attacking uh, Houston on Thursday? Uh, I think, you know, we need to use our inside game. And I thought, you know, last night, uh, you know, last night's game, we did that at times. I mean, obviously, CeeLo started off, you know, seven for seven and whatever he had, you know, to start the game. And then we kind of went away from that. You know, I think, you know, obviously we have, you know, good perimeter shooters and, you know, we can knock down threes at times, but our bread and butter in my opinion is is our inside game because we have size at all positions um you know usually you know uh zulis is is scoring the basketball easily down there over mismatched you know usually at his position then CeeLo and even balo um you know have done a good job of, of controlling the paint and really scoring underneath and if we can do that early and kind of get those guys try to get those guys in foul trouble um early and just dominate the backboards um you know we're going to be in good shape to win and you know, we've been shooting decently from the three-point line. Um, you know, Kerr last night struggled, obviously, uh, but I like the shots that he was taking. I trust him to take those shots, and we're going to need him, you know, in, a, in the long term if we're going to make a run run at this whole thing. And so for him to be out there, you know, you got to give him a lot of credit. That ankle was not something that is normal for someone to play on. And for him to, you know, play the, deep, the way defensively he did, battle it even those last three threes that he shot from the corner you know i thought every one of those was going to go in that drives me crazy man (laughs) (laughs) 
He's open. He's open, yeah, man. I yeah. would tell him to shoot it too. If I, you know, if I was his teammate, I'd be like, shoot the I'm, we're riding with that. Ben knew he was going to shoot it too. That's why he was in position, you know, to get down for offensive rebound and make that huge play. So um, you know, I love I just love these guys. And uh, you know, I'm hoping that we can keep it going. I think they've learned a lot in this last win. And hopefully, you know, they come with the energy and effort, which they've done all season long to, to get another victory uh against Houston on Thursday. I got two more for you, and then I'll let Eric wrap it up. Uh, who ne- who else needs to step up for this team? I mean, Ben Mather and Christian Coloco had great games. Azulis Tabellis, like you mentioned, kind of disappeared at, at, for large stretches of that game and wasn't even on the court for, for a good chunk of it as well. I- anyone in particular who really needs to step up in this next game for the Wildcats? Um, I th- oh, we need Zoo. I mean, you know, our team plays the best when he's playing well. And so, you know, when if we can get him off to a good start, him scoring the basketball and dominating in the paint, and, you know, do, facilitating from the top of the key like he's done all year long. And also, I think Justin Kyer. I think Justin needs to play a little bit better. Um, you know, he, he uh, played hard last night, but I think he'll have a big game, and a, a good game on Thursday. We got to give a lot of credit to, uh, you know, credit to Pella Larson. I think he's been playing amazing. Um, you know, he's been playing extremely hard on the defensive end. He's knocked down timely shots um, and, you know, made key plays throughout the, the the stretch of the game that have led to winning. And so he's done a really good job. But I think if we can get Kyer and, and Zoo, you know, out there playing at a high level, we'll, we'll have a really good chance to win. And, you know, CeeLo's been playing amazing basketball. Um, you know, Ben has been Ben and, you know, like you said, improving his draft stock, you know, every single game out there. There's, I haven't seen a guard really better than him, you know, in this tournament or really throughout the year, the player that he's turned into and what he can be. So, um, you know, we have all the ingredients, but, you know, tournaments, the tournament, you got to be ready to go every single game in Houston. Uh, at least we're not going to overlook them. You know, we'll be ready to play them. My last question for you. Um, a lot has been made about just the cockiness of this team. You know, you see a lot of TCU fans getting upset about the players waving goodbye to the fans in San Diego after the win. Kirk Carissa, you know, being Kirk Carissa doing the TCU frog hand signal after the game. What are your thoughts on that kind of stuff from this team? I like it, man. I have to be honest. <laughs> We, our team was cocky too. You know what I mean? You, you have to be, you have to kind of be like that. Um, you know, if you're going to, you know, make a run and win a championship, you got to be that. You got to believe that you're the best team and you got to believe that your teammates are the best ones out there with you. And so, you know, I, people can get upset about that, but I like it. It's in the spirit of the game, man. You got to, you got to believe it. If you're working hard and you're having fun out there, Hey, you know, do you represent the, the A, you know, Arizona is the place you want to be. And, you know, I'm just happy to have the team that we have and the guys that we have. And, you know, I enjoy it, man. I, I like a little bit of trash talking, a little bit of bravado. You know what I mean? That's that's part of the game, man. If you, you're you working hard, like, hey, go ahead and do it. You know, I normally ask you, uh, all right, what do you think is going to happen? The rest, we, we already know what I already know what you think is going to happen. <laughs> So let's talk about 97 again and the Kansas game. We're going to talk, let's talk about the sweet 16. You guys struggled in your first two games against uh, double digit seeds, as you and Shane mentioned earlier, then you face the consensus number one team in the country of Kansas. Talk about the last few minutes. What is going through your head in a tight game? Uh, Just kind of put us, what what do you remember about that 25 years later? Uh, Just still the, really the will and a drive of us that we were going to still win the game. You know what I mean? Like we were up by, you know, double digits and obviously them being, you know, the number one team all year long with, you know, great guys, Paul Pierce and Jock Vaughn, and, you know, all those guys, grateful friends, um, they weren't going to give, they were going to give up. And so, um, you know, when they started hitting those threes at the end, back to back, we had a couple turnovers, you know what I mean? We got a little bit nervous, but I was never, worried that we were going to lose the game and you know i've said this before like before we even played them in the shoot around before the game in the practice before the game we for whatever reason knew that we were going to beat them and no one else in the country believed it but all the guys in that locker room believed it and so you know miles had a hell of a game that game um you know mike bibby did jt hit some big free throws at the end you know to really settle us down and get us that victory and but that last play, you know, what I still think about is when that ball went out and it was rebounded and tipped out to the friends in the corner, and I went to challenge that shot in the corner. I'm just happy that I didn't foul him, man, because that would have been the worst. That would have been the <laughs> that would have been the worst because I'm like, oh, that could have been like if he would have kicked his leg out or anything, I might have fouled him on that. So 
that's what I still remember about that game. But um, it was just an incredible matchup, man. And, you know, I just remember how happy my parents were. And I, it was just a an insane uh, feeling after that game. And, um, you know, to knock off the number one team that year, especially since we knew we were going to do it before the game started. No, I'll, I'll just mention real quick, Eric. Today, actually, we're recording this Monday night. It actually happens to be the 25 year anniversary of that game. Is that yeah. right? This is yeah. that wow? How about that? Who would have thought 25 <laughs> years later, AJ, you almost uh, ran into Ray Wolf? No, I'm just kidding. But it's cool <laughs> that you're with us. Uh, my last question for you, and, and thanks as always for joining us. When did you guys know that you were going to win the national championship? Was it in overtime of the Kentucky game, or did you know after that Kansas game, we got this? It was really one game at a time, man. It, it really was. Like, I, it, it was never like we never discussed it. We never talked about it. Like, hey, we can win this. It was just like the next team up, and we're gonna beat that team whoever, who's ever in front of us. Uh, we believed, you know, fully in each other. We had the, and I've said this a million times, but we had the purest chemistry of any team that I've ever played on. So we were really having fun. We had a good time. We were working our asses off, but we were. You know, we were just enjoying the ride and, you know, nobody had an agenda. Nobody was trying to go to the NBA. We were just trying to win games. And so it was just fun to knock off, you know, every team that we played, you know, nobody gave us a chance really besides after the first two games. And so, you know, it was just uh, an amazing time to be playing with your guys, with your brothers out there, you know, competing at the highest level and able to get victories. And it was just, uh, it was just the greatest time of my life, man. It was just so much fun. Well, you guys definitely uh, represented what it means to survive in advance. And let's hope this Arizona team 25 years later is as fortunate. AJ, always glad to talk to you. And we hope to uh, be celebrating with you uh, in the next uh, few, few weeks. Me too, man. I appreciate you guys. Thanks for having me on again. Here with Dale Duncan, a very satisfied customer of Backcourt Marketing. Dale, can you tell us what Backcourt was able to do for your company? Well, they're taking me to the next level with helping me connect to new people for my business. They're helping me find new customers online. They meet with me monthly. And they're listening to what I need and they're really focused on helping me get there. Excellent. Well, Dale, we appreciate your time. If you know someone who needs social media help, refer them to Backcourt Marketing and get rewarded. Or if you need social media assistance yourself, make sure to check out backcourtmarketing.com. Thanks to AJ Bramlett for joining us. Always an entertaining guest and a lot of great sound bites. So uh, just really glad to have. We have a lot of awesome guests that come on this program, and he is one of them. So uh, very cool to get his insight. Shane, before we move on to the uh, the men's basketball side, I just want to touch on uh, the women uh, beat UNLV in the first game. Sam Thomas beat her sister Jade, unfortunately, against uh, North Carolina. Recording this on Monday night did not go so well. I got smoked, uh, but a great a great career for Sam. Uh, yeah. She helped turn this program around and Arizona got to win the tournament. So I guess you can't really be upset about that. No. And I'm glad that you know, this is really the third year in a row, Eric, that they deserve to host a couple of NCAA tournament games. And they finally got that chance. Yep. It was cool to see Sam go against a, a, her sister, Jade, even though Jade didn't play much for Kayla Rooks to come and play in Tucson, which I know meant a lot to her personally with her dad, uh, Sean Rooks, uh, former star at Arizona who passed away a few years back. And then, you know, I'm not shocked by the loss to North Carolina, you know, Arizona was struggling down the stretch. I don't think Kate Reese was a hundred percent. So, you know, disappointing way to finish it, but I'm glad that, that Sam Thomas and the team got a couple more games in front of a, a fantastic home crowds uh, at McHale center. I think the second biggest crowd for any um, women's turn uh, tournament game uh, this past weekend. So good to see that you know, disappointing way to finish, like you said, but uh, they would have had a tall task against South Carolina in the Sweet 16 anyway. But you know, look at this team going forward. Uh, they got a lot of uh, players coming back. You know, obviously they're going to miss Sam's leadership and her defense and three point shooting, but a lot of talent coming back. And then you got three players in the top 50, four in the top 100 in terms of uh, national recruiting coming in. So they're going to be uh, they're going to reload for next season. And I think they're going to. I'll make a bold prediction that they will host another couple of NCAA tournament games next season. Awesome. Well, let's hope so. Kate Reese deserves in her senior year, her fifth year, uh, she deserves a chance to uh, to host and, and get the ovation that Sam Thomas did. Just a great, great scene. It was really cool that Adia called a timeout with a couple seconds left to, to get Sam out of the game and get yeah, her that ovation. Have to that, do that. That yeah. she's right. I was wondering, I was like, when is she going to do this? But yeah. uh, that was cool. I really want to uh, just it, real quick, Shane. I, I know that the baseball team, a huge three game sweep over, uh, I think, number 12, Stanford. I mean, this baseball team that Chip Hale has uh, rocking and rolling. Uh, three comeback wins, no less, too. You see that grand slam uh, tonight, We're recording Monday Chase night? Davis, yeah. I don't think that ball's landed yet. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. And they're 
last I saw, they were number five in RPI nationally. Yeah. That, that's probably they're probably higher than that now. So they picked up right where they left off under Jay Johnson last year. Um, you know that that that, that head scratching loss to GCU is a distant memory. Although GCU is off to a good start too. So it wasn't well, they that get awful. they get they get to play him again at uh, at GCU. I think next week or something like that. So. Yeah. Uh, Let's hope baseball keep rolling. We'll talk more about them in the coming weeks. Same with softball. Had a rough one. Uh, did not score a run yeah, against not, UCLA. It was not good. Not good. N- not doing so well against ranked teams this year. Mm-hmm. I think over against any team that's ranked. So probably not the year for softball. Baseball probably, you know, could be interesting. So, uh, you know, we appreciate uh, we'll, we'll talk more about them uh, as we go along. But it's on to men's basketball predictions. We're in the Sweet 16. Shane, let's go down each of the regions. Uh, just make your picks. Uh, Elite Eight and then final four in each region, and then we'll do Arizona last. All right, the West, uh, we have Gonzaga against Arkansas and then Duke against Texas Tech. Uh, Predict the winners and then who who advances uh, to the final four. Yeah, my bracket was pretty boring. I actually had chalk in that region, so I, there's no reason to change it now. I, I, I mean, Texas Tech could absolutely get past Duke, but I, I think it's going to be Gonzaga and Duke, and I think uh, Mark Few uh, sends, sends, sends Coach K back, and I think Gonzaga gets to the final four. I think Texas Tech sends Coach K packing, and so does Vegas. Is uh, as Texas Tech is a slight favorite as of right now over over Duke. Uh, my pick was uh, fairly chalky, but I had Texas Tech against Gonzaga, and I'm going to stick with Gonzaga over uh, over the uh, Red Raiders to go to the Final Four. Okay, uh, we'll go down to the region that got shaken up by North Carolina. They now take on UCLA. The Bruins get a pretty good matchup, and then you in the other side of the region, the, it's Purdue against the aforementioned. St. Peter's, which I know that we're all, you know, excited about. Great. Uh, Shane, who who plays in the regional final and then who goes to the final four out of that crazy region? Yeah, I had I had UCLA against um, Kentucky, Kentucky. Yeah, well, yeah. Obviously that's not. But no. uh, I, I'll put it this way. I think the UCLA North Carolina winner goes to the final four. And I, I'll stick with UCLA at this point. Um, you know, that collapse North Carolina had against against Baylor, you know, you get up by 20 something that that's great, but that, that collapse wasn't, wasn't pretty. Um, I'm, I'm shocked that they won the game in overtime when it got there, but I think UCLA, you know, they, they survived a tough first round matchup. I think that opened their eyes a bit. They handled a very good St. Mary's team pretty easily. Uh, I, I would be surprised if they don't come out of that region. So I, I had UCLA before the tournament started and I still have UCLA. Boy, if you're a Purdue fan, you gotta be like, Oh my God, we got St. Peter's. This is going to be easy. Now St. Peter's, has won what nine in a row, something like that. So they've been pretty good. Uh, Purdue should blow them out by 25, just based on the size. St. Peter's can't match up with that. Uh, and I think UCLA beats North Carolina. UCLA over Purdue. I had UCLA coming out of that region, as you did as well. So I think we're going to see a Gonzaga UCLA rematch in the Final Four again. Kansas's yep. region: Kansas against Providence, and then Miami against Iowa State in the most improbable game of this Sweet 16. I, I don't see a way that Kansas doesn't win, and I like Miami better than Iowa State. Would you agree with those two picks? I'll go Kansas, but I'm going to go with Iowa State. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it necessarily matters that much, um, but I think we're, we could have an all uh, Big 12 Elite Eight. Um, but yeah, Kansas. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I gosh, I wish I wish that Arizona had that region. I mean, and knowing Arizona though, they'd probably make it more difficult than it needed to be. But uh, I picked Kansas to get to the Final Four before the, the tournament started, largely because I thought their region was going to be the easiest. Well, now it's even easier. So I, I think I think Jayhawks uh, cruise to the Final Four. All right. So you and I would, if in that scenario, we all agree, Gonzaga, UCLA, Kansas, we had those three teams making the final four. Mm -hmm. And then we, we differed when it came to the South region. But before we get to that, Shane, just want to thank our primary sponsor, Backcourt Marketing. Check them out, backcourtmarketing.com and at backcourtmktg on Twitter. They are posting some really good stuff, including last night when uh, during the Arizona craziness, they had some funny tweets. So check them out. And if you know a small business that needs some social media help, let me tell you, they are the ones to do it. So check them out, backcourtmarketing.com. All right, Shane, this is the one area where you and I differed. You took Villanova. I took Arizona. Let's start with Villanova, Michigan. Did the Wolverines have a chance to win this game? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They do. I, I, um, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but, but I think Nova wins. I, I like, okay. I love, I love their experience. I, I love how disciplined a team they are. I think um, former Arizona coach Russ Pennell was on Twitter the other day talking about how, how good they are in terms of fundamentals, in terms of, um, you know, not getting baited into, uh, into offensive fouls, just doing a lot of just very well coached team. You know, if you mind that with the experience, like I said, they have two guys on that team. 
uh, who won a national title a few years ago. So I, I'm Michigan. I, I think we're finally seeing that top 10 Michigan team we expected to see, but I think Villanova is a tad better. Okay. I would agree. I think Villanova beats Michigan. Could be an entertaining game, but then comes the game that we all care about uh, seven o'clock uh, or ish on, on Thursday night. It's Houston against Arizona. Now, Houston has what, like what, two quad one wins, including UCL or including Illinois yeah. uh, all, all season. But the metrics, as you said, really like them. So Shane, break this one down. How do you see it playing out? It's crazy because again, like you said, the metrics, uh, Arizona's number two in net, Houston's number three. Uh, Houston's number two in Ken Palm, Arizona's three. Sagarin, Arizona and Houston are two and three. ESPN's BPI, which we all love, uh, Houston's two, Arizona's four. Uh, Houston leads the nation in field goal percentage defense. Arizona's number 11, but, um, you know, Arizona's number three in field goal percentage offense. Houston's up there as well. Uh, big contrasting styles between these two teams. Arizona's number five in tempo per Ken Palm, uh, which is uh, possessions per 40 minutes adjusted for opponent. That's how they get that metric. Houston is number 333 in tempo toward like the last. very, yeah. toward the very bottom. Well, Villanova is even lower. Hmm. Um, but wow. uh, as our friend Blair Willis noted, the lowest tempo team Arizona's faced so far this year is Cal at 330. Okay. Houston's a little more talented than Cal. So you think, yeah. Yeah. So possessions could come at a premium and turning the ball over 20 times or close to it. Isn't going to cut it against Houston. Uh, they have to take better care of the ball. Uh, you know, and Houston lost two key players to injury early in the season, but that hasn't slowed them down. And they nope. really haven't been challenged. And they made tournament. the final four last year too. They did. They did. Yeah. And you know, again, that's another similarity with Villanova. So some of the, the keys to this game real quick, I'll try to be quick. Go ahead. You know, they got to limit the turnovers, you know, uh, they, they have to keep it in the low teens to have a chance they have to do, which is not something they've done so far in this tournament because Odds are they're not going to get as many chances with the ball as they've had in the first two games because of the way Houston plays. Okay. Uh, I agree hundred percent with AJ Brown, but I think they have to pound the ball inside and try to get Houston into foul trouble early. Uh, Houston doesn't go very deep, uh, especially with the injuries they're dealing with uh, their big man, Josh Carlton. I think they have to get him in foul trouble. He's a 6'11, 245 pound super senior transfer from uh, UConn averages about 12 and six a game. Houston's really going to have to depend on him to try to neutralize Coloco and Balo, who I, again, I wouldn't mind seeing on the court at the same time, at mm -hmm. least from time to time on Thursday without Carlton, Houston's pretty guard heavy and would have to play some small ball and Carlton's fouled out twice in Houston's last seven games. So something to keep an eye on. Also Houston defends the three pointer very well. Uh, so it's probably not in best in Arizona's best interest to chuck a bunch of threes. And I'm talking to you, Kirk Creasa, especially early in the game when you try to set the tone and, 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 and take an early lead. If they're able to get some open looks, fine, but don't force it from the outside. And then on defense, I think Arizona has to challenge Houston to take some outside shots. You know, they're, Houston's a very good two-point shooting team, but they're just 34% from three-point range. You know, Marcus Sasser was their best three-point shooter. He's out for the year. Houston has one player who shoots better than 34% from three. That's Fabian White Jr., who shoots uh, just under 39. Arizona's not elite at defending the three, but they're not bad. And I think that's got to be the strategy. You know, take it inside in Houston on offense, force Houston to take outside shots. And if they knock them down, so be it. But that, those are, without predicting the game here, because we're going to get to that, those are my keys to victory for Arizona. All right. So a team, the only team that Houston lost twice to in conference play, and albeit they made up for it in the conference USA championship game was Memphis. Memphis plays generally quick. Um, Memphis, mm -hmm. as you saw, gave Gonzaga uh, a heck of or a heck of a lot of trouble. We're up 10 at halftime the other night uh, on Saturday night. So Memphis is like the way I kind of look at like a poor man's Arizona er, team, right? Yeah. And just look, I mean, without, without breaking it down, like you, you gave a lot of great sets, just, the eye test. That's how I look at it. I Memphis is like a very poor man's Arizona. Um, I think the Wildcats will, I, I, let me just say this. I, before the game against TCU, I texted a friend and I said, I have a feeling that TCU will be a tougher game for Arizona than Houston will. Can't explain why, just had a gut feeling. My gut feelings regarding this Arizona team have been pretty accurate this season, as you might remember, Shane. Been yep. pretty spot on with, yeah. you know, I had a feeling, hey, there, USC was going to play him tough that one time. Oregon was going to play him tough. Just had a feeling. I think we're going to beat Houston, you know, fairly. I, I, we're not going to sweat as much as one would think. Really? I really am confident Arizona is going to win this game. And I think height is the key. You have mentioned yeah. that Arizona, you know, with the, with uh, Coloco, Tubelis, and Balo. 
I think they're going to cause a lot of problems for, for Houston. I think Arizona is going to take care of the ball more. I'm going to say the Wildcats win this game by at least six points. You know, I have gone back and forth on this all day. I'm going to be recording this Monday night as yep. far as, you know, and I picked Arizona originally to, to, to get to the elite eight, but I thought the Illinois was going to be the opponent. Yep. And, and I underestimated Houston, like the selection committee. Did I had well. Houston. I had that in my bracket. You had Houston. Like, I okay. was, yes, it did. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, and I should have picked Houston, obviously. I feel like on the one hand, Eric, at some point, Houston's bubble's got to burst because they're they're just undermanned, but they keep finding ways to win. But, you know, the metrics love, love Houston, and the metrics aren't everything. I mean, if it was all about the metrics, Kentucky would have beaten St. Peter's sure. by 40 points. Of course, yeah. So I, I don't put as much stock in that as some people do, but it's hard to ignore that Houston's toward the top in every single one that I that, okay. that, that most yeah. people pay attention to. So okay. I think it's going to be a nail-biter. Uh I, I guess since I had Arizona going to the Elite Eight, I'll stick with it. I am not nearly as confident as you are. I, I and I think one of the keys, Eric, is whether this team has learned from its mistakes or you know, I'm I'm fine with the cockiness, I'm fine with some of the arrogance as long as they learn from their mistakes and don't just think they're 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 bulletproof. Because if they play like that against Houston, like they did the, the against TCU, they're gonna get their ass kicked. Yes. Okay. So if Arizona beats Houston as we're both predicting. Then it comes down to the Wildcats against Wildcats. Mm-hmm. Um, let's discuss what you you picked Villanova originally mm-hmm. to beat to beat Arizona. I picked Arizona to beat Villanova. I, I'll give my take first. I'm sticking with that that Arizona makes the Final Four, but I see it as a one possession game. End of the game, that roller coaster that we saw on Sunday night. I think we will see something similar, but I, I won't feel as nauseated because Arizona is where they should be at that point. They should not have lost in the second round. They are at minute. This is where they're at minimum. I said, sweet 16. Remember at the beginning of the year, I said, mm-hmm. I want to see sweet 16. Yeah. So they're where they should have been at, at, you know, my, my early expectations. I want to see elite eight. Of course I want to see final four and then it's all house money from there. I do think Arizona is on bonus time because they should have probably lost against TCU, but I think the Wildcats win 68 65 against Villanova and advance to the final four. Shane, what is your prediction? Assuming those two teams make it there on Saturday. I haven't seen anything in this tournament to change my mind. Uh, I had Villanova beating Arizona before the tournament. I haven't seen anything to to suggest that I should change my mind at this point. So, and look, the bottom line for me is, at this point, and I, I'm big on experience in this tournament, and maybe I put too much of an emphasis on it, but you look at Houston, which is loaded with seniors, Villanova, which is loaded with seniors, and guys who have been to the Final Four and, in Villanova's case, won a national title. I think that's just too big a hill to climb for Arizona to, to win two of those games in a row for a team so inexperienced, and some of that inexperience is shown uh, in this tournament. You, you factor in Kirk Creasa, who's – I still don't think it's hundred percent. I don't think it's going to be until next season. I think it's just too, too big a hill. So I, I think if Arizona gets past Houston, I, I, I just, I think lightning will kind of have to start strike fight, not lightning, but you know what I'm trying to say that I, I think Arizona would have to overcome some pretty big odds in terms of experience and tempo as well. Like I said, Villanova right. he plays an even slower tempo than, than Houston does. I think, Try, having to win two of those games back to back is is too much to ask. So again, uh, I'm flexible, and I think if look if I saw something different, I might change my pick. I just haven't, and I think uh, I think I'm going to stick with Villanova over, over Arizona in the Elite Eight. All right, um, you know what, Shane? I, I'm I'm for some reason I'm really confident in this Houston game. I, this Villanova game, you flip a coin. I, I, Villanova is really good. Houston's really good. Both coaches, Kelvin Sampson at Houston, Jay Wright, fantastic coach. If, if Arizona, or if Tommy Lloyd, I'm sorry, Eric, if Tommy Lloyd is not the coach of the year, then Kelvin Sampson should be because of the odds he's overcome with two of his best guys being out for the season. I mean, I know they went to the Final Four last year, but but this coaching job of his has been phenomenal. Both of them are great coaches. Arizona's going to make it to the Final Four. Just let us one time. Can we just overcome this hump that we haven't seen really since what 2001? 21 yep. years since Arizona's been to the Final Four. A whole and, person old enough to drink. That's right. I mean, these these kids in college who are who are freshmen and sophomores and some juniors at, at U of A have never been alive to see a Wildcat Final Four team. I feel like this is the year, Shane. It's time for things to change. I want to thank AJ Bramlett 
uh, for joining us once again uh, on this long show that we've had. I want to thank our sponsors, Ice Shaker, and of course, Backcourt Marketing. Shane, let us hope this, it's, it's our time. Let's hope next week on our show, we have a lot to talk about and we're super excited after two amazing wins. It's been a fun one. For Shane Dale, I'm Eric Cohen. As always, bear down. Thank you.